Welcome to Clinical Thought of the Week. You should know me by now. My name is Dan Brown, hashtag the blogging tutor. Now I wish to spend a few special minutes discussing prostates. Now we all know where they are and what they do, hopefully. In clinical practice, we need to be mindful of a possible presentation of prostate cancer or other benign conditions such as BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy. Let's switch to tutor mode to see where this takes us. Hi, and welcome to my classroom. I would like to focus on the case history screening to look for clinical indicators of prostatic dysfunction. I wish to concentrate on prostate cancer and benign prostatic hypertrophy or BPH. Let's consider some of the symptoms that our patients may experience with prostatic dysfunction. It is important to note here that any change to their normal habits or behavioural patterns should be taken very seriously. I like to think of the symptoms in the order in which they're likely to occur. Firstly, let's consider urgency. This simply means the patient needs to go quickly and find a loo right now. Unfortunately, this tends to occur in the middle of a big shop. Secondly, once the patient reaches the urinal, there seems to be a delay and we call this hesitancy and this can be bloody frustrating and very uncomfortable. Next along the line, once the patient begins to pass urine, unfortunately it seems to be very weak, as if there's a kink in the hose pipe, and we call this a reduced stream. And finally, once the patient has left the urinal, they may have a little trickle down the leg. They may refer to it as incontinence. We tend to call it postvoidal dribbling, or another phrase that's used is incomplete evacuation. There may be other symptoms, of course, such as a general increased frequency, basically a desire to go more often, and of course if this is at night, which it often is, we class this as nocturia. Of course, we must always look for traces of blood in the urine. This may represent bladder cancer, but can be a symptom of prostate cancer. We call this hematuria. Great summary of some of the symptoms. But caution here, some of these symptoms only manifest once the tumour or enlargement has progressed quite significantly. This highlights the importance of a good case history and a sound clinical line of inquiry. We must be searching in terms of our questioning, but demonstrate a level of sensitivity as always. Let's look at some of the possible investigations if we are suspicious of prostate cancer or BPH. Welcome back. We all know what this picture represents. A perrectal examination. This is where the GP will insert their index finger into the anal canal and palpate the posterior lobe of the prostate. If it's hard and irregular, this may suggest prostate pathology. This is a routine clinical examination. The GP may also request a PSA blood test. Now PSA stands for prostate specific antigen. This is a protein that is secreted into the bloodstream if there's increased cellular activity of the prostate through cancer, inflammation or enlargement, for example. Now, good practice would be that all our male patients over 50 would have a PSA test every two years. Of course, if there's a history of prostate cancer, this should be done sooner. Or if there's a change in our patient's micturition habits, as described earlier, a PSA test should be requested. Now, if we are suspicious of prostate pathology, then we should palpate our patients in guinal lymph nodes. Now, texture is important. In benign lymph nodes, they tend to be less than a centimetre, smooth, rounded, non-tender and mobile. But in lymph nodes where there's metastases, they tend to be hard, firm, irregular, tender and tethered. So have a think about this. A truss biopsy may also be performed. This is a transrectal ultrasound biopsy where a needle is inserted into the prostate under ultrasound guidance and tissue is extracted. 
This can then be analysed for tumour grade or type. Now, there are other investigations that can be performed, but these are just a few I wanted to discuss with you. That was a very useful look at some of the screening methods our GPs may request for our patients. Let's see what else our teacher has to say. Let's look at some of the complications of benign prostatic hypertrophy and prostate cancer. Now a key complication of BPH is acute urinary retention. We have to remember that the prostate gland sits snugly around the prostatic urethra so any enlargement or growth could potentially impede this canal. This could lead to damming back of urine and cause massive bladder distension. Furthermore, this could track back to the kidneys and potentially be fatal. So immediate treatment via catheterization is required to decompress that bladder. Now, a classic operation to correct this would be a TERP, a transurethral resection of the prostate. Now a resectoscope will be placed through the penis, the prostate gland located and small portions will be removed to make the prostatic urethra competent again. This also can be used for prostate cancer where the tumour invades the prostatic urethra. Looking at prostate cancer, we have to be mindful that there could be metastatic spread. This is usually via the venous plexus network to the lumbar spine, ilia and hips. Furthermore, it could go then to the brain via Batson's plexus. The architectural matrix of the lumbar spine and the ilia and the hips could be compromised, potentially predisposing our patients to a fracture or spontaneous collapse of some kind. But it is worth remembering that most prostate cancers do stay local and do stay unchanged for some time. However, we still must be very vigilant when we consider our patients of a certain age with certain micturition symptoms and certain presentations. Always be suspicious. These complications underline how important it is that we advise our patients to consult their GP for appropriate screening earlier rather than later as a preventative measure. Let's now look at some of the treatment approaches to prostate cancer. One of the oldest approaches to prostate cancer is a radical prostatectomy. This is direct open surgery, which removes the prostate tumour, possibly some of the seminal vessels and local lymph nodes as well. Now, depending on the discussion with your surgeon, they may consider a robotic keyhole approach. Another treatment is HIFU, or High Intensity Focal Ultrasound. This is where high frequency ultrasound energy is used to heat and destroy the prostate cells, usually via a probe in the rectum. Now brachytherapy is very interesting and I've had a number of patients recently who have chosen this approach. This is where radioactive seeds are placed inside the prostate and it destroys the tissue locally. Cryotherapy is not widely available in the AHS but this is where needles are inserted into the prostate and a gas is released which effectively freezes and destroys the prostate tissue. Now female sex horns may be administered for prostate cancer. We know that things like breast cancer are often driven and fueled by estrogen. Well, in the same way, prostate cancer is often driven by androgens or testosterone. So if we give female sex hormones to our patients, then it aims to suppress the cancer and the growth. However, we have to be mindful of what's called a tumor flare. This is where the body thinks it hasn't got enough androgens or testosterone and pumps out more. And of course, this could ignite the tumour. But of course, these discussions will be had with your surgeon and the team that's looking after you. Something I do wish to discuss is this phrase, watchful waiting. Remember, prostate cancer doesn't, doesn't necessarily grow very fast. And if it's locally contained and your PSA levels are quite low, it may be that a better approach is just to wait and monitor and just see what happens over a given time period. Again, this can be discussed with your GP and your surgeon as to which approach is most suitable. That completes our brief glance at prostate screening. Let's continue to look out and be an advocate for our patients. Please consult this website for further information. Thank you for watching. Please like, 
comment and subscribe to my clinical thought of the week and check out my other videos. It's bye for now. Dan Brown, hashtag the blogging tutor.